So the idea is to first bother you for, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes or so with some technicalities. And then just at the moment you start to really the thinking of your nap, I will show the software and then maybe you revive a little bit. Um, so in, in the goal, it is like this, we have a core division, or I would like to have a core division in everything that we do. On the one hand, we have the real coffee talk, which is a physical resource. And then on the other hand, we have all kinds of digital derivatives of this. And these di digital derivatives can be digital photographs, texture 3D models, or the photographs, or polygons. I will explain in this talk what I mean with bike polygons. And <clears throat> the important thing to remember is that of course, the idea is to have as much metadata as possible about the graffito, but also these digital derivatives have their own metadata, like when was the photograph taken or who made that polygon. And so each of those have their own metadata. And very often we use these digital derivatives to get metadata for the real physical uh, graffito. For instance, if you want to know the extent of the graffito or the height, you do not go out and measure. We would make a polygon and then measure this digitally um, so that we infer information from the real graffito uh, via the digital derivatives. <laughs> Good. Uh, going back to this slide, the main thing I will be talking about are digital photographs. So let's now delve a little bit deeper into digital photographs and their metadata. Uh, in general, you can consider digital photographs as a kind of container, and this container holds pixel values, as you know. And very often these pixel values are your primary photograph, but most of the image formats also store one or more thumbnails. And then next to these pixel values, we have also the so-called photo metadata. And this photo <laughs> metadata can reside either internally inside the digital photograph or externally. And externally, sometimes this metadata is stored in what we call the sidecar file, which is a file with the same name as a photograph with a different extension, or this external metadata can also reside in a separate digital asset management system, which we very often abbreviate as DAM. So <clears throat> let's now review some of those metadata standards that exist and which one we then leverage inside the So metadata in general, photo metadata comes in two big categories. Um, we can call them EXIF and IPTC. So let's delve a little bit into this and, and hear what this means. Because one of the aims we do, in, or let's say one of the aims we have in Indigo, is that we want to stick to all the, well, not all the, all the metadata standards we think are relevant, we try to stick to. So if you um, look at metadata categories, we can have administrative metadata, descriptive and structural metadata. With for photographs, you can forget about the structural metadata. It's mainly administrative and descriptive. And administrative is often subdivided in the technical and in the rights metadata. Now, in the terms of technical metadata, this is stored in your photographs as EXIF metadata, which means the moment you take a photograph, whether it's with your smartphone or your professional camera, things like shutter speed, aperture value, uh, ISO value, um, maybe location if you have a GPS attached, are all written by the camera inside your image file. You don't have to do anything. The camera just all this writing for you in the so-called EXIF metadata standard. EXIF stands for exchangeable image format. And this is stored in so-called EXIF container. And this resides inside your file. This is always inside your file. So if you visualize this, we have the image pixels here. And you always have an EXIF header just above your image pixels. Now, for the rights and the descriptive metadata, uh, <coughs> there are Let's say a few standards. The most important one was announced in 1991, which was the IPTC um, Inter Information Interchange Model. IPTC stands for International Press and Telecommunication Council. So it's a uh, metadata standard proposed by press photographers. And um, this metadata is stored inside the so called IPTC IIM metadata container, also internally, so also in the file you had a kind of container holding this metadata. This metadata, as I said, is descriptive and rights. So copyright information, keywords, and so forth were all written inside this metadata container. Um, 
2000, 2012, Adobe comes up with a new kind of way of storing metadata. And this um, incentivizes the IPTC to rethink what they have been doing. And they develop their information interchange model into what is now known as the IPTC core metadata standard. And later in 2008, they have the IPTC extension standard. And these two standards, they have, or let's say they, they leverage the XMP uh, container, which was um, developed by Adobe. So powerhouse and digital image processing. And an XMP container, so to say, is either stored also internally in your files, but here it depends on which type of files. If you take normal JPEG photographs or TIFF files, it's always inside your file. If you have raw photographs, it's always outside your file, it's a sidecar file. And also these XRP files are normally read by your digital asset management system. So if we visualize this, we have in the JPEG photographs inside our XRP container, in the raw photograph, you have a sidecar file, which has the same name, and there the XMP is stored. Yeah, thank you. George Algy, thank you. Yeah. Now, apart from the IPTC, many other standards started to rely on this Adobe Extensible Metadata Platform. So this is what XMP stands for. Adobe themselves announced different subcategories, which we call XMP namespaces. This is how they are called. We have one with basic information, we have one with rights information and ones with the um, media management information. So these are the standard XMP namespaces. And then there are a lot of additional ones that have been proposed by other instances. Plus, for instance, is an American association, which is only a concern by licensing for uh, photographers. Um, the Blinkor is a metadata schema. EXIF is, let's say, the XMP variant here of the one that is normally created by your camera. So they transport this also to XMP, and they have many more. You have the Photoshop metadata schema, the camera raw, so to store all your settings, and so forth and so forth. And all these ones are specific, non-standard XMP schemas, exactly like IPTC is. So when the IPTC converted their metadata schema from the information interchange model to the core and to the extension model, they were borrowing from other metadata standards as you can see here for the core and for the extension. Um, and these are now what we call the IPTC standard. So these two versions of metadata are what we call the IPTC standard. These are not generated automatically. This we have to generate. The user has to generate this themselves. So one more thing to mention, Indigo itself is also working on an XRP namespace because none of these metadata standards records all the processing steps you do before the graphs. And if you want to trace back how we went from our basic photograph to our finalized version, we would like to document all this in an open way. So that's why we work also on our own uh, namespace. What do you have to remember from all of this? Three things. Photo metadata can be very complex. Extremely complex, so it takes us a lot of effort to make sure everything is according to the standard. There are two very big schemes, XF, IPTC. EXIF is always stored inside your camera. You normally don't do anything with this. Your camera stores this for you. IPTC is what you, the user, can add to your photographs. And depending on whether you have a JPEG or a TIFF or a PNG or a RAW photograph, it is stored either inside or outside of your file. Now, the relevance to this talk is that the IPTC extension standard, which is updated every year, launched in 2019, the new photo data standard, and there they introduced what we call image regions. And these image regions, as you can read, are defined as a, as a region inside an image, um, delineated by some boundaries, and all these pixels inside this boundary are part of this image region. Now, this would mean that you could make an image region here and attach some metadata simply to that region. Or you make one here and that's attach your metadata simply to, to those 20 pixels inside your old um, photograph. However, there were some um, problems um, with this. And the first problem is that implementing an image region is not that straightforward because it's rather hierarchical. So many softwares cannot really properly deal with this. For instance, we have first the region boundary. And the region boundary tells you, okay, what kind of shape is this? 
it's a rectangle or a circle or a polygon. Good. How do we measure the location of this polygon or circle? Either in pixel or in relative coordinates. Okay, fine. And then we give all the coordinates by which we can measure either a rectangle or a circle or the vertices of your polygon um, so that we can define where in the image one or more regions are. Then we also need an identifier, so a unique identifier for the one or more regions you embed in your photograph um, and also a name for every region. And then there are two, um, two very important types which you attach to the region. One is the region content type, which means that you have to define what type of contact is in that region. And that information comes from a controlled vocabulary. Okay, for instance, you can say what I have here in this region is artwork. And this artwork, the definition of artwork refers to a controlled vocabulary. And the IPTC has a lot of controlled vocabularies. One of them is the news code scheme, which of course it's a present telecommunication um, body. So of course they have a lot of news codes. And here you see there are concepts like um, animal or artwork, but there is still the concept of, of graffiti. So this was another problem for us. They don't have the concept of graffiti there. Then there's also a region role, which has exactly the same type of buildup as the content type. And this role says, okay, what is this role of this, these pixels and the bigger frame? Is this like an area of interest? Is this the main uh, study subject? What does this uh, region really indicate? And then finally, <clears throat> the image region by the IPTC can have any metadata property that is XMP based attached. So we could say in this part of the image, I see graffiti artist A, and this one I see graffiti artist B. So you can really say which pixels belong to which artist or to which uh, artwork. So we thought, well, this is very interesting. But there was no software, or there is still no software that can deal with image regions. Although the standard is now already out for four years, and there is no software that can even make these image regions. So we thought, let's make the software ourselves because the standard is there. So we designed uh, Glafis and Graphis is a software. The acronym means generate regions and annotations for photos using the IPTC standard. And Graphis consists of four main components. First, you have the graphical user interface, which I will then show in a few minutes. So here, this is our graphical user interface where we do all the interactions with our, um, with our photographs and our metadata. So the user is interacting over the graphical user interface. And of course, the user always um, does his or her operation on photographs. So we have photographs, but these photographs are not directly read into our user interface because in between, we have our database. It's an SQLite database. Why SQLite? Because as everything in Indigo, it's open source. It's freely available. So that's why we use SQLite. And upon reading the photographs in our user interface, the only thing that happens is we store the path to these photographs. So we can always uh, quickly load these photographs without embedding them really physically into the database. And this is how it looks like. So we have more photographs and this is the relative path. So even if you take the program and the folder to another, computer, it will still work if you don't change your folder structure. And then everything that happens inside the program is directly stored into the database, not directly into the photographs, but into the database, which means at any point in time, the database stops working, crashes, uh, sorry, the software stops working, crashes, everything is simply stored here and you can restart your work at any, some, at any moment in time. So for instance, this is all the all the stuff I was doing, this is all saved directly into the database. Now, <clears throat> to do all this, there is one tool which forms the backbone of a lot of the work that we do, or a lot of the work that is done at, at Achia, which is Access Tool. Access Tool is another free software tool, but it's the powerhouse for um, everything that concerns metadata. It's the only tool that reads all possible metadata from images and can also change all possible metadata from images. And it's really available. So we tie Exif tool into Graphis. So, what, so here you see some more information. Um, what happens when you read the photographs into Graphis? They are first transferred to Exif tool. Exif tool extracts all the metadata. So also if there are already image regions indicated or not, and that imports this into our uh, database. Now, the moment that we want to then start drawing, 
these regions, we need to have this concept that I explained before, right? So we need to know, is this a graffito or is this an animal or what would this be? So for this, we have a controlled vocabulary. And since the IPTC controlled vocabulary does not account for graffiti, we made our own controlled vocabulary since um, we have our partner ACDH, which is with the vocab service, which is uh, good at this. So we have our own graphics image region vocabulary, where you see the region roles or area of interest, means subject area, region type graffito or text for graffito. So this is uh, expandable as we go. And this is fed. So well, either we say in the graphical user interface, save everything into the photographs. What happens is then the database is read and using Excel tool, everything is written into the photograph or we export as a CS file file which can then be read by uh, Excel or any spreadsheet program. Okay. So as all the tools that we use, Graphics is open source, freely available from our GitHub page, uh, also using this QR code. And the idea is now that I quickly give a demonstration on how uh, to use Graphics. So let's see how this works. Hope it even works. So. So we start Graphis <clears throat> and as everything that we do gets um, tracked with the correct metadata, you first give in your name. If you have an org ID, so an identifier, you can use uh, this one. If you have a specific link or website or so, you can also use it there. I am already an existing user, so I can simply select my name and my metadata is there already. And I start. <laughs> and Upon working with Graphis, the first thing you do is you create a new database. So I will create a new database and we call this database demo go indigo. Okay. And then you can load photographs. You can load one single image, a whole folder of photographs or folders and all the subfolders. So let's just do uh, one folder of photographs. Thank you. So we have here some graffiti images. Hmm. And then you see, maybe it's a little bit small, but you see here that um, the images are imported, which means exit tool is now reading all the metadata uh, inside these images. And there we have them. So on the upper left, you have some database statistics. We have 10 photographs, zero circles have been indicated, 18 rectangles and uh, zero polygons. The same codes or the same color codes you find here on how the regions appear and also in the photographs here. So if I go to the photograph here, you see 13 in green, which means there are 13 um, rectangles already indicated in this photograph. So I can also open this photograph and I see the 13 rectangles, right? If I want to change the appearance of one of those, for instance, I would like a fluorescent pink or whatever, you will see it changes here. It changes also the setting lower. So you can see it here as well, and here and here. So the colors are everywhere typed. I can double click on one image region and I get here all the information. So this is graffito text. This is the identifier. This is the region role and the content type. I see that I created this image um, and there was a transcription made also by myself. Um, and this is how this um, piece is read. So it's marking. I can go to an older, you can go to an older example uh, for instance, here, this one, I click, I see it's Stefan who did this, and Stefan read this as AZ. So at any point in time, you see who created the region, who adapted the region, and also who made which transcription. And this description and transcription, this is not included in the image region standard, but this is what we added because the IPTC allows to have any kind of information added to these image regions, right? So. I can have information for one image region. So let's go again to our photograph and we have a few more. Okay. So I can see here the basic information. If I want to see all the information, I go to view region info and I extend all. I see all the coordinates. So all this is read from the database and can be stored in the photograph if you want and can be stored in a separate CS file file also if you want. If you want to see all the information of all the, all the regions, we go to all region information. We see here there are 13 regions. 
you can uh, expand all of them and we can check all the information if you would like to, to do this. So let me know, give you a quick example of how you make it in its region. Um, let's say we take, for instance, this one here. Okay. And we mainly in Indigo, we work with two types of image regions, right? So we have either, you, we can use all of them, of course, but the standard that we are currently following is the following. If we have a rectangular region, this is normally to indicate so text, and then we transcribe this. And we also define using a polygon, the outline of every graffito. So if I go back to my smiley and I say, okay, so this, let's say is here a uh, graffito. So I take my polygon tool, or sorry, here my polygon tool, here are my regional operations. And I can start drawing very crudely my smiling. Okay. Like this. You see, automatically we get a unique identifier, which is the name of the photograph and the moment it was created. We can give it this, this a name if we know the exact name. For instance, this is Graffito, Graffito ID 25 in Indigo, for instance. You can give it the name you want. This is the main subject area of this, of this photograph. And this is tied to this controlled vocabulary, which says, okay, it's coming from the graphics controlled vocabulary, meaning main subject area. So if people would like to know what we mean by main subject area, they can go to the CRI. The same for the region content. This is um, a graffito. Um, you see that automatically the region creation information is created. Description and transcription is empty because it did not do anything so far. So I can, I don't transcribe this because it's not text, but I can say that this is a, this is a nice smiley, for instance, nice smiley. Control S or on the diskette here, and this is saved. So if I would now double click again, all the information is there. And in this way, we try to outline every single uh, graffito that we document and also read um, all the text that we see in these photographs. Um, and as I said, the way that you can then deal with this later is you can go here and say, save bonding boxes to CS file file. And this we very often do because we have also a student that is working on deep learning to automatically read graffiti. So we do this for him. He just gets a file with this image has these and these coordinates and at these coordinates, I find this transcription, right? So then he feeds it into his neural network or we can save this directly into the photographs uh, themselves. Good. Must. So, yes, um, using then, uh, again, the slide, which I showed you before, I told you we have different digital derivatives. So it's very important, I think, to always consider what is metadata that relates to the real graffiti, what is metadata that relates to the digital derivative. If you talk in terms of polygons, we use it for three things, or for five things, I'm sorry. We either delineate graffito text or we use it to uh, outline the graffito. <laughs> and in terms of outline, if you use it for a graffito outline, this is, for instance, taken into account by the software of Benjamin. So when the software of Benjamin makes an ortho photograph, we know that only these pixels have to be corrected and all the other we can discard because we have the outline of the, the thing that interests us, which speeds up processing. The graffito text we use for transcription, so we can store inside the photograph directly how text gets transcribed, and we also use it to feed an automated deep learning network to automatically read a graffiti. And the graffito outline, apart from helping us generating more derivatives, is also instrumental in finding metadata for the real graffito. So dimensions, area, perimeter can be computed over it. We use it, we also are using it. At the moment, you're still developing this to automatically extract the colors of the graffiti. So we know only these pixels we have to consider, not all the surroundings. And we also uh, use it to reason about temporality. And this will be the topic of, of the talk tomorrow, how I show how we use polygons and temporal timestamps to reason the temporality and in, uh, in, in Nico. And this was everything I want to tell you. Thank you.